these slides uh, because I want to get to the good stuff, which is around some of the practice transformation efforts that are underway and how pharmacists are being utilized uh, better and better than they were previously. Um, Madeline uh, mentioned this, but just as a, as a little bit extra background. Um, so in Ohio, we uh, did a lot of drug pricing research to help uncover some massive overcharges that were occurring in our Medicaid managed care program. Um, along the way, um, we decided that we would start doing more drug pricing uh, research uh, rather than uh, the policy side of things. So I officially launched a, a nonprofit called 46 Brooklyn Research in 2018, uh, where we publish and translate publicly available drug pricing data for the public. And I also have a consultancy, Three Axis Advisors, where we do for hire work on, uh, on the drug supply chain. In that capacity, I serve as an advisor to the American Pharmacy Cooperative Incorporated and the American Pharmacists Association. Um, so pharmacist compensation, so regardless of how far, or why or how much pharmacists get paid and what plan sponsors or, or, or uh, Medicaid programs or whoever is paying the bill is charged, uh, I will focus here on pharmacist compensation. And the reason we focus on compensation Compensation we don't like to talk about, but really compensation is where the mission comes from for the business of healthcare. Uh, we churn out great graduates in medicine, nursing, pharmacy, but really the world that they live in will be a business like anything else. And so uh, in the pharmacy context, uh, pharmacists are compensated largely through dispensing. The capabilities and the scope of practice for the pharmacist has been growing However, the reimbursement model has not been evolving in unison. As such, dispensing remains the, uh, the lifeblood of the pharmacy practice. It's the financial oxygen. And because of this, pharmacist compensation is embedded in the transaction for medications and is heavily influenced by issues that are surround drug pricing. So pharmacist revenue or pharmacy revenue is predominantly concentrated on the dispensing function. So anything that could impact dispensing really starts impacting the service model of pharmacy. And so because the pharmacist form of compensation exists within the drug, then we have to look at drug prices first. And so this is uh, research that we do over at uh, 46 Brooklyn. We analyze list prices for uh, medications. And so um, at the beginning of this year, we launched a dashboard where we're tracking drug price increases over time. Now, on an annualized basis, drug prices, or at least the number of increases has been going down since 2015. However, a look at January, which is when most drug prices are being increased, January is kind of the bellwether month for all price activity. And what we've seen so far is that 2021 appears to be altering the recent trends of a downturn. The chart to the right shows you the Januaries of the previous 11 years. And as you can see, with 929 price increases, this January looks like it's going to be, uh, it's going to put 2021 in, a, in the driver's seat for perhaps the most ever, because January had the most price increases in over a decade. Before you go get your pitchforks uh, and torches for the drug makers, um, here's another way to look at the exact same data. If you look at overall increases and the impact on the system, we see that if you look at the median price increase, it is down to its lowest amount in a decade. And if you weight average, so if you take a weighted average based on Medicaid drug utilization data, so we're getting a good sample of, you know, hey, okay, who is actually taking these medications? How many people are taking these medications? When you weight these price increases, they're also down to their lowest point in a decade. So the most increases that we've seen in a decade, but the lowest degree of increase over a decade. But those are just the list prices. What's happening to the net costs? Brand drug manufacturers offer rebates to insurers and PBMs for preferential formulary treatment, which thus lowers the net costs or at least what the manufacturer is selling the price or selling it as a price point. Federal officials have been questioning the utility of these rebates due to the likelihood that manufacturers are inflating their list prices to accommodate for bigger and bigger rebate concessions to entice PBMs to cover the medications. What's happening is, is that these drug maker discounts and rebates are growing faster than list prices. 
So um, it's an it's an interesting dynamic that the drug makers are raising their prices, but they're actually taking less and less of the price hike, meaning that their discounts are flowing through the supply chain to insurers and PBMs. All right, so we're here to talk about uh, pharmacist, you know, transformation. You know, why are we talking about drug prices? Well, again, so much of this impacts the financial flow of dollars within the pharmacy level. And so the question we see on these rebates and brand drugs is, well, okay, so there's list prices, then there's net prices. Well, how do we know we're actually getting a good deal? Well, because brand drug manufacturer rebates to PBMs and insurers are confidential and vary widely from plan to plan, program to program, it's extremely difficult to pin down what the actual net price is. Because government entities like the VA and Medicaid programs command such large discounts and rebates, smaller payers and patients who pay out of pocket end up taking a disproportionate share of the cost. And because each PBM and plan promote utilization of different drug mixes, apples to apples comparisons of the overall net cost is extremely difficult. This inability to determine what a fair price should be hinders the ability for true market forces to pressure supply chain margins and promote quality and efficiency in drug spend. That's because the system with which we live in is built on fake prices. The list prices are wildly overinflated relative to real prices and the PBMs use AWP or average wholesale price as the basis for their pricing guarantees to both pharmacies and plan sponsors. Brand name drugs have high AWPs that are offset by the rebates that I discussed earlier, but generic drugs also have high AWPs that in no way reflect the actual prices pharmacies pay to acquire those drugs. In both regards, the actual prices of both brand and generic drugs are hidden from the plan sponsor and the patient. Here's the fallout of this problem. Anytime that you have a list price and then a, a negotiated discount off of the list price, what you have is a system of price discrimination. Rather than the list price being the price that everyone pays, the list price is the price point with which negotiations begin. And so Medicaid programs are, Medicaid, are, are mandated to get the best prices. Then you have other plan sponsors that get slightly worse deals along the way. And then you get to employers, small employers and patients who pay out of pocket or in pre-deductible phases who are paying a disproportionate share of the list price compared to others. So the question then is, where's the savings for employers? They're investing a lot of money in these drugs and pharmacy services are they getting comparable discounts and prices to everybody else in the marketplace? We did an analysis of a small insured group of employers, brand, brand spending equated to $110 million in 2018. Of that spend, we identified only $5 million in rebates. The best commercially available price, if you were to take those, those dollars and extrapolate them to what typical or the biggest plan sponsors get, they should have been getting $30 million in rebates, meaning they were charged $25 million more than other payers in the marketplace. So what we also see is that because uh, PBMs, pharmacy benefit managers, are setting the prices and they're setting the formularies, they also get to determine who fills the prescriptions at what price. And so what we did for this small employer group is we analyzed the degree with which pharmacies owned by PBMs were filling medications. And what we could see is that expensive medications, 76% of the expensive medications were being filled by pharmacies owned by the PBMs. Well, on the other end of the spectrum, you have the cheap drugs, only 16% of those medications were being filled by PBM owned pharmacies. So the takeaway here is that PBM owned pharmacies are getting a higher concentration of expensive medications, which means that they're also getting a, a lot of the complex or specialty medications facilitated through their drug channel. We did data analytics to examine the prices once those medications were being filled at PBM-owned pharmacies. 
And this is uh, data from the Florida Medicaid program where we analyzed all their largest plans to determine the prices of these expensive medications. And if you look apples to apples and compare the prices at PBM owned pharmacies versus regular pharmacies, in every instance, medications were more expensive to the state when they were being dispensed through PBM owned pharmacies versus traditional community pharmacies. Those uh, examples extrapolate on an individual level with drugs like Humira. Again, if Florida Medicaid would have recognized the non-PBM cost of these claims, they would have achieved $1.5 million in savings on Humira alone. Let's look at generic drugs. And don't worry, we're going to get into the service side of things here very soon. High price brand drugs give birth to high price generic drugs. We did an analysis of 1,247 drugs that lost patent exclusivity from 2005 to September, 2019. For each brand drug in the sample, we looked at the first generic version brought to market and compared the generics launch AWP to the AWP of its equivalent brand the month, pro the month prior to its launch. The key takeaway from here is that a huge proportion of the medications that came to market adopted sticker prices that were zero to 15% discount from the brand drugs that they sought to, to replace in the market. So generic drugs, which we rely on for savings, adopt many of the same sticker prices as the brand drugs that they seek to copy. To give you a sense as to how disconnected AWP or average wholesale price is from the real price, I'll show you generic Nexium here. Generic Nexium has an AWP of $797.40 for a 90 count bottle uh, as of June, 2020. If you were to compare the sticker price to the actual prices that pharmacies pay to acquire the drugs, you would see that the sticker price is 47 times higher than the actual prices pharmacies pay to buy the drug. So uh, if you look at national average drug acquisition cost, which is a survey compiled by CMS, or a state, Alabama, uh, we use Alabama, they mandate pharmacies participate in these surveys where pharmacies turn over their invoices to CMS or in the case of Alabama to the state, and they quantify what the actual prices are that the pharmacies pay to buy the drugs. And they are obviously significantly cheaper than the, than the fake AWP or the sticker prices of those medications. I say that because when we pay for drugs, we're also paying for the pharmacist service. So the key here is, is that how do you compensate a pharmacist through, uh, through, the, through a payment through the dispensing function when the sticker prices are so detached from the real prices of the medications. AWP or the list prices of these drugs is a broken benchmark uh, for generics. The chart to the right here shows the, the average prices of, a, of different benchmarks for the same drug. So this is that same bottle of Nexium that we looked at on the prior slide. And if you look at the wholesale acquisition cost, if you look at the national average drug acquisition cost, or if you look at the average acquisition cost, you will see in all those regards that as the number of labelers enters the marketplace, which is represented by the orange bars that are going up over time, the, the increased number of manufacturers drives down the real prices of those medications. However, the blue line at the top of the chart is the AWP, that average wholesale price, the sticker price. And as you can see, as generic competition is beating the heck out of the prices that pharmacies pay to acquire the medications, the sticker prices are actually going up over time. That's because AWP is designed to increase over time. So this chart to the right here is a chart that maps out all of Ohio's Medicaid drug utilization data. And what you see here is that we took the exact drugs that the Ohio Medicaid program paid for over a five and a half year stretch. And we weighted it exactly as they bought it. And as you can see, the real prices of these drugs deflated by 40% over five and a half years. So doing exactly what the generic marketplace is designed to do. 
However, the AWP or the sticker prices of those same medications weighted the exact same way, went up 34% over the same time period. I say this because again, the pharmacist reimbursement lives in that system. Not only does the pharmacist reimbursement live in that system, but so does what the plan sponsors pay. So state Medicaid programs, employers, et cetera, are all paying for drugs based on discounts to AWP. These four examples are from big PBM contracts with plan sponsors. And as you can see, they've tethered all of their pricing guarantees to an inflating benchmark. So what we started doing in Ohio was evaluating what was happening underneath those sticker prices. Because again, we're paying for pharmacist services through the dispensing of drugs. And what we found was that PBMs were taking advantage of this large gap between the real price and the, and the fake price and paying pharmacies low, billing the state Medicaid program high and pocketing the difference. So in Ohio, where we got our start, um, we crunched some data to show directionally what we thought was happening in terms of abuse of the system. Um, we found that yes, pharmacies were getting paid low, the state was getting billed high and pocketing the difference. Our state auditor opened the books and found $244 million worth of spread pricing, which is that gap between pharmacists paid versus what the PBM billed. And they were pocketing and overcharging our Medicaid program. But Ohio wasn't alone. This chart to the right is what we found in the state of Michigan. The blue line represents the cost of the medications. The green line represents what 450 pharmacies were paid on average for those same medications. The orange line represents what, they, what the PBMs were charging to the state Medicaid program. And as you can see, the drug costs were going down, the pharmacy margins were going down, but the PBM spread, the difference between the green line and the orange line were going up exponentially. And through all of it, the prices were going up to the state. So there's been a big backlash against how PBMs are setting prices. More and more states are, are reigning in the problems, auditing the books and, and uh, banning uh, some of these anti-competitive practices. More and more states are moving to throw PBMs out of their system altogether because of their, the abuse that they've been putting into these uh, Medicaid programs. But it's not just spread pricing that PBMs are taking advantage of we're finding that PBMs are finding ways to pay affiliated pharmacies more than they're paying their competitor pharmacies. So this is an example uh, from CVS Caremark in the Florida Medicaid Managed Care Program. We analyzed data directly from the state and were able to see that the reported costs at CVS pharmacies when Caremark was the PBM for the managed care organization, all of a sudden CVS pharmacies or at least the reported costs at CVS pharmacies went up significantly relative to independent pharmacies and grocery store pharmacies like Publix. We found the same problems that we saw on our commercial data set where PBMs were steering expensive medications to their own pharmacies and then overcharging plan sponsors for them. The same thing that we found on the brand side, we found on the generic side as well, except it was far more exacerbated. We found that on generic drug claims that were more than $1,000 per claim, PBM affiliated pharmacies were filling over 50% of those prescriptions at a markup of over $3,400 per claim. More than $2,000 more than other pharmacies were getting paid for the same services. Now keep in mind, those $1,000 for a claim is already insane but they were, all, they, were, they were overcharging to the tune of over $3,000 per claim when they were filling the prescriptions at their own pharmacies. We found the same thing in Ohio uh, after the state ban spread pricing, all of a sudden specialty drug prices shot through the roof and most of those prescriptions were being steered to PBM owned pharmacies. It all gets even worse. Patients are paying more. Analysis from, from my home state of Ohio found drug costs spiking to the point of 5.7%. Over that same time period, patient out-of-pocket expenses increased 18%.
So patients are picking up a bigger share of the tab. In Ohio, we also found that we were losing pharmacies all over the place. Uh, for the three years prior to spring of 2018, Ohio saw a net loss. So this includes openings. We saw 164 pharmacies plucked off the map. And over that time period, all major pharmacy chains saw little to no growth. The only pharmacy experiencing growth was CVS pharmacies, which grew by 68 locations over that time period. And it just so happened that CVS's PBM, Caremark, was the one setting the majority of the reimbursements in our state Medicaid program. Pharmacists are doing more with less. Investigation from the New York Times in 2020 showed chain pharmacists blowing the whistle about unsafe working conditions that they felt were leading to errors. A survey released by the Ohio Board of Pharmacy just last week highlighted major problems within uh, the pharmacy marketplace with a major, an overwhelming majority of pharmacist employees at chain pharmacies felt uh, feeling that they, dis, or they, they strongly agreed that they felt pressured by their employer or supervisor to meet standards or metrics that may interfere with safe patient care uh, in their practice settings. And as pharmacists are being pushed to the brink financially, we're finding that they're finding creative ways to make money. We did an analysis back in Florida, we were able to see dispensing of calcipitrine cream. We found that of the, of the plans that were paying pharmacists the most, we found that those pharmacies tend to be uh, dispensing a greater share of the prescriptions under high price plans versus low price. To give you a sense as to how that works, I have no idea how pharmacies were doing this. We found one pharmacy that was making so much profit on calcipitrine cream that it was equivalent to the total profit reported on all generic drugs dispensed at 980 small Florida pharmacies combined. So all generic drugs dispensed at 980 pharmacies it was the equivalent of one pharmacy dispensing just calcipitrine cream. So I say all of this because pharmacy has horrible incentives. Aside from the anti-competitive concerns within the PBM industry are the very real challenges of diminishing pharmacy access in eroded standard of care and perverse incentives that can over reward pharmacies with questionable ethics. The biggest problem in pharmacy is that when you are paid to fill a prescription, whether you're paid too much or too little, the best ways to maximize profitability is to maximize the arbitrage opportunities, seeking out those calcipitrine cream examples, or to fill more prescriptions, fill them faster, and fill them with less invested resources, which means less time with the patient. If we follow the current business model in pharmacy, the pharmacies that work hardest for the patient are also the pharmacies that put themselves at the greatest economic disadvantage. So what we need to do is pay pharmacies smarter. Don't just pay them more, pay them smarter. So back to the pharmacist scope of practice. Many states are expanding collaborative practice laws, empowering pharmacists to order labs, prescribe medications, and administer those medications as well, all under collaborative practice agreements with physicians or nurse practitioners. Many of these collaborative care models have specific focuses on diabetes, hypertension, asthma, and pain management. In my home state of Ohio, we have a broad uh, pharmacist uh, scope of practice under collaborative agreement where multiple physicians can form collaborative agreements with multiple pharmacists and allow them to manage any chronic disease state and prescribe any medication and order any lab and administer any medication so long as the doctor or the nurse practitioner uh, has um, empowered the pharmacist to do those things. Many states are also moving beyond collaborative practice and finding what I'll just say is a gray area, not in a bad way, but there are some things that pharmacists can do, for example, like immunizations, where they can dispense something or initiate something under a standing order or protocol. Uh, many states are moving beyond immunizations and looking at other things like giving pharmacists the ability to prescribe under a standing order tobacco cessation products, contraception, over-the-counter products, certain dermatologicals, naloxone, 
and a lot of other items in the marketplace. States are also enabling pharmacists to conduct lab tests and in some instances, even prescribe medications based on the results of those tests. Many states are also allowing pharmacists to administer medi uh, any medication as well. But the payment models aren't evolving in unison. Despite the growth in pharmacist capabilities and the expanded education and training, a lack of compensation for these services make many of these advancements more aspirational than operational. And because pharmacy, for all the reasons that I, that I gave you earlier, are in this really awful hamster wheel uh, from a financial incentive standpoint and from a margin standpoint, we're seeing this no margin, no mission play out in real time where states are advancing pharmacist scope of practice way beyond what it was 20 years ago. But when you walk into your Walgreens, your CVS, or your independent, you're not really seeing many of those changes at the pharmacy level, largely because there's been no compensation model to allow the financial bandwidth for those uh, services to exist. What we need to do is hit the reset button. Pharmacies are way over reliant on dispensing margins as their primary means of sustainability and profitability. Those margins, as I've shown you, are being siphoned at a disproportionate level to PBM and insurer owned pharmacies. Traditional pharmacies are being stuck with more and more underwater claims and less overpaid claims over time. These pressures erode access. They're eroding pharmacy resources and the overall standard of care in pharmacy. The result is an assembly line culture that is increasingly difficult to interrupt with new time-consuming clinical services. Meanwhile, pharmacists face increasing debt, dwindling employment options, growing burnout rates, lessened job satisfaction, and increasing patient challenges. So as the scope of practice has been evolving, the payment model has to change now as well. And so here's how we did it in Ohio. We amplified all these pri drug pricing distortions. We discussed the ways that the pharmacy pressures were impacting not just the pharmacist, but the patient, as well as the, as, the, as the physicians and nurses who had to interact with the pharmacy. We highlighted the poor incentives, the excessive costs, and the less than desirable provider-patient relationship. We were unafraid to talk about the skeletons in the closet that you know, not all was well in pharmacy. And we use the heightened awareness and focus on pharmacy due to all the PBM problems. And rather than just fighting for more money in an old broken system, we've worked to change the way that we pay for pharmacy rather than just investing more in the old way in hopes that it raises the bar. I'm gonna play a short video that happened shortly after all the PBM things that I, that I or a lot of the PBM things I described happened in Ohio. We had a hearing where um, lawmakers started grilling insurance executives about how they were going to work to change the model. Assembly uh, last year passed SB 265, recognizing pharmacists as a health care provider. Without deferring to Medicaid, I want to hear your plans. Uh, what are your plans to integrate pharmacists into the care models so that we can emphasize value over volume? So the goal that CareSource and all the other plans and ODM are working on together is to create a complete transparent model. And again, is pharmacists are the most important part of the equation, and people don't think about that. Pharmacists touch thousands and thousands of people every single day. So if you combine that, and one of the other things we're very, very excited about at CareSource is we're creating a command center, it says, and that command center is going to take all real-time transactions. Pharmacy transactions are the most real-time transactions we have. And we're going to bring that information in, and we're going to know what's going on. We're taking it a step forward. We are going to pay for physician services allowed by law. 
and, and engage the pharmacy, the pharmacist in providing those services. In addition, we're going to do what's called MTM, Medicaid. So then we're going to take it one step further, and we're going to pay the pharmacist to provide an assessment. So we talked about the social determinants of health. We're going to ask them to do a very quick assessment that says, do you have a food insecurity? Do you have a housing insecurity? And we're going to pay them to feed that information to our command center, and then we might get a Meals on Wheel delivered to somebody's house. But it's more important for us, we're going to offer that service to every independent that is out there. Um, so yes, I'm excited. I, the passion that you can feel from Steve, I also uh, would like to convey. We've actually been sitting down with OPA um, and, and as well as academia to begin to test exactly what Steve was just referring to. How do we model out a methodology to provide the pharmacist as a valuable part of the, ch of the chain? How do we begin to look at them like a provider as a point of service? The pharmacist sees them. They actually have a relationship <laughs> with them. So let's start thinking about how we incent that kind of engagement and bring additional value through the system um, and all the work that we're doing. It's very data driven. We're working with uh, OPA. I know Antonio's in the back. Really trying to think through our next transformation of providing this, um, of adding value into the pharmacy space. And so I, I am extremely excited about the work that we're able to do here and, and begin to actually, um, I think, influence a different value proposition. Um, are you allowing Caremark and CVS to still control your program? Yes, actually, we are working with OPA to come up with a model. We're working on what are those best practices and how does that look. But we want participation from the pharmacy community. We don't want to do this in a black box, actually, why we're working with OPA to do exactly that and the independent pharmacies, pharmacists. And I think a, a common theme you're hearing is that we are all very excited about the ability to leverage our pharmacists to the highest level of their licensure. And I think that's what the new bill is going to allow us to do. And uh, this is an area where I think I'm hearing we're all working closely with the Ohio Pharmacists Association as the experts as to how can we do this well. Melina is doing the same thing, really wanting to understand specifically uh, to the question on independent, or excuse me, the uh, yeah the independent pharmacists, how we can support them. That. So and then all, lastly, I would share something that we are evaluating is specific in what I would call critical access areas. So your more rural communities, what do we need to do differently for those independent pharmacies? So uh, really looking at a new model and, and opportunities to support those specific independent providers. So, thank you. so here, here's what's happening in Ohio. We passed a law that, that grants pharmacists provider status, which again, is that incentive. Can a pharmacist be paid for their clinical services rather than being overly reliant on the dispensing function? And so uh, the health plans are now uh, stepping up and actually compensating pharmacists for a lot of those cognitive services uh, that, they, that, that pharmacists are allowed to perform within their scope of practice. Large plans like United Healthcare, Molina, Centene, CareSource, uh, and Paramount, uh, which is a regional plan in Ohio, are all have those programs up and running. So uh, September 2020, Modern Healthcare uh, uh, Magazine had this on the front front cover of their uh, of their magazine about how pharmacists are becoming um, you know moving to the center of a care revolution and for I know this is a multidisciplinary call you know for other providers that are on, on on the call you know understand that a huge challenge in bringing a patient to goal has been just accessing that patient checking in on them uh, you know making sure they're they're fulfilling the treatment goals that you know their physician or nurse practitioner have have given them. Well, a patient is walking into a pharmacy, uh, often you know, it could be as much as 20 times a year. Now, sometimes they're not happening, they're not actually going to the pharmacy counter, they're picking up milk, milk bread, eggs, whatever. Um, but you have a six to eight year doctorate level trained professional uh, standing behind a counter. What do you wanna do with that opportunity? Do you want to check in with that patient? Do you wanna have a conversation? Do you wanna test their, their blood glucose? Do you wanna check you know, whether check their blood pressure. Do you want to have a mental health, you know, screening with them? It is even as rudimentary as it could be. All of those things represent a massive opportunity where you are eyeball to eyeball with a patient, where you can feed information back to, back to um, the, the patient's physician or make an intervention right there on the spot. United Healthcare is paying for post-discharge counseling. So right, uh, if a patient's being, uh, you know, discharged from, from a, 
from a facility? Can we prompt the pharmacist to have a deep dive with that patient right off the bat when they when, when they finally are ever turned to home? All of those things represent opportunities to make sure they could calibrate a patient's therapy for the better. So in Ohio today, they've stripped PBMs of their price setting capabilities. Uh, and now they've implemented provider ID numbers for pharmacists where pharmacists are now getting paid for services and managed care plans are being compensated in return by the state for all services rendered in coordination with uh, physicians, physician assistants and nurse practitioners. All Medicaid plans are now required to do medication therapy management. Pharmacy steering, so PBMs pushing patients to their own pharmacies uh, is being restricted by Medicaid. Um, we're seeing more value-based reimbursement contracts beginning to take shape and all the managed care plans now have uh, things up and running. And in fact, the MyCare program in Ohio, which is essentially those dual eligible Medicare Medicaid patients are now able to get these services as well. But it's not just Ohio, provider status programs are off the ground in Washington, Iowa, Tennessee, and many more. Massachusetts just signed a provider status law in January, 2021. We're seeing innovative pharmacist service models growing with the Community Pharmacy Enhanced Services Network and other types of network. We're seeing pharmacy services administrative organizations, with our, which if you don't know uh, what those are, I apologize for adding more alphabet soup into your life, but they are essentially the contracting agents who act on behalf of pharmacies to in, engage and interact with plans and PBMs. Large plans like Humana are actually paying pharmacists to actually reach patients uh, to their diabetes outcomes uh, within the Medicare program. We're seeing large insurers investing more and more internal resources to get pharmacy services off the ground. And a really interesting thing in Ohio and something that I was kind of pessimistic on at first was the state really limited compensation in the Medicaid program to services rendered under collaborative agreement. Um, well, what that means is that a pharmacist can't be paid for service unless they're within a collaborative practice agreement. And uh, I was pessimistic that we would see um, physicians going in on this, but more and more physicians are being exposed to value-based contracts. And now that they're being evaluated based on the readmissions, they're seeing an opportunity to partner with pharmacists to help make sure the patients are meeting their goals and staying out of the uh, emergency department. So what's in store for the future? Um, the scope of practice is growing, uh, what I would just say at a reasonable pace. Um, would I like to see it be a little bit more liberalized? Absolutely. But we also live in the real world where, you know, we don't, we, progressive care models are not going to exist outside of really low access states like Idaho or Montana or things like that. And there's very liberal scope of practice laws out in, out in those states. But really, you know, I think the scope is, is growing where it needs to. And I think you'll see incremental steps along the way. What's standing in the way of actually reshaping the care model is that the over-concentration of incentives on the dispensing function where I explained all the dysfunction that lives. So rather than a model predicated on speed, volume, and arbitrage, pharmacy should and will shift to a more service-oriented role with a gradual shift in incentives from dispensing to outcomes. So with that, uh, that's the uh, that's my song and dance. Um, I'll, uh, Madeline, you want me to go ahead and ask the questions now, uh, the learning assessment questions, or do you want me to pause, sure. whatever you want? Sure, we can, and I put these in the poll if you wanna um, see, see them that way, or people can answer in the chat, whichever you'd prefer. All right, so which of the following is not a drug pricing distortion? A, the difference between AWP and actual pharmacy acquisition cost. B, the usual and customary price of an over-the-counter medication. C, the hidden rebates that flow from manufacturers to PBMs. Or D, the clawback that a PBM assesses a pharmacy through its PSAO. So I'll just launch that poll for everyone so that. Ah, oh, great. You quantifiably see what everyone thinks. Got about half people voted so far. Let me trickle in a little more. Uh, 
All right, I'm going to end it and share the results for you. 74% are correct. The usual and customary price of an over-the-counter medication is not an example of a drug pricing distortion. Great. All right, next question. How are pharmacies primarily compensated for their services? A, co-pays from cash paying customers, B, medication therapy management, C, rebates from Medicare and Medicaid programs, or D, reimbursement for dispensing drugs? All right, looks like people have stopped answering. Exactly right, reimbursement for dispensing drugs. True or false, a pharmacist can make any clinical decision and prescribe any medication uh, independent of a physician. That should be an easy one. Yeah, we got a lot of <laughs> got a lot of answers really fast on that one. Go ahead and end it. False. You're correct. False. Lastly, which of the following is not part of the pharmacist's scope of practice? A diagnosing lung cancer, B, chronic disease management, C, ordering medications through collaborative agreements or D, interchangeable biosimilar substitution. Got it, diagnosing lung cancer, exactly. All right, well, look, it was, I know it was, uh, it was a lot of alphabet soup and it was grueling through some uh, wonky drug pricing stuff. I would have it no other way. I apologize if, it, if that's not your speed, um, but uh, really the main takeaway is, is that the drug pricing transaction is so dysfunctional and because pharmacies over-reliance on, on it, through, for compensation, um, it makes really pharmacy practice uh, highly dysfunctional at times. And so um, it's, we're, hit, we're in a very exciting time, as pessimistic as a lot of all that, all that sounds. We're seeing an evolution of the pharmacy marketplace occurring. And um, I'm very optimistic and bullish that, um, that we're gonna start seeing uh, these new care models start evolving now that we're seeing health plans and physicians and nurse practitioners all start uh, engaging in the same buy-in. Wonderful, thank you so much. We do have a couple questions in the chat um, that I don't wanna overlook before um, before we get to any, any live questions people wanna ask by unmuting. So let's see, Jenny Minchow asks, isn't the low reimbursement caused by MCO PBMs rather than Medicaid rebates? Yeah, so low reimbursement is, is definitely more of a, it's, it's the MCOs uh, and their PBMs without question. Um, the Medicaid rebates, um, it's a different, it's a kind of a different component of the transaction. So what I'll say is, is that yes, pharmacies uh, reimbursement, yes, those come from MCOs and PBMs. Medicaid rebates are things that um, are, the, are the discounts that manufacturers are providing the state Medicaid programs Medicaid programs get the largest discounts off medications. And anytime somebody's getting the best deal, somebody also is going to be getting the worst deal. Mm -hmm. And so you, there's an argument to be made that Medicaid rebates have an inflationary effect on the prices that everybody else has to pay for the same medications. Thank you. 
And then Evan Sisson asks, what is the primary force behind the elevation of insulin pricing? PBM, manufacturers, other? So uh, insulin, as well as other complex competitive classes of drugs, um, they are, there's a, there's a combination of blame, but drug pricing is unlike any other marketplace where in other marketplaces where there's a good degree of competition, you see uh, quality increase and price actually decrease. Um, drug pricing, it's the exact opposite because drug makers aren't competing on list prices. They're competing on post discount prices. What we see is that the, the difference between list and real price is infinitely more with insulin drugs than we see others. And so if you're looking at the sticker prices of insulin products, drug makers are kicking heavy, heavy rebates and discounts back to PBMs on those medications. That again has an inflationary effect on others who aren't getting those discounts. But what it also means is that the degree with which PBMs pass those discounts on for a patient copay or back to the plan sponsor is really crucial. So if I was to point blame in one particular direction, uh, I'd put it more concentrated on the PBMs and the Medicaid programs who are getting the biggest discounts off of those list prices. Yeah. Um, John Buhai asks, prior to the provider status bill in Ohio, did the MCOs express or lobby for pharmacists reimbursement? reimbursement? Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> absolutely not. Um, you know, I think that uh, if I was to put it carefully, I think the PBM bruising that they took um, really put them in a position where they had to come up with something else. Um, they had to have, um, they needed a better answer for what they were doing to the pharmacy marketplace. Um, I think that we kind of forced the first bit of Kool-Aid down their throats, uh, but after they got a sip, they, they wanted more. Uh, and today, those same MCOs who we had horrible relationships with years ago are some of the best relationships that I could ask for. Um, so I think they've understood that pharmacists as a profession have lived in the pharmacy benefit, which the managed care plans have outsourced to PBMs. And so pharmacists as a provider have lived on this island where PBMs often have different incentives of the actual health plans. I think the health plans have kind of had this out of sight, out of mind mentality about pharmacists. And now that we're kind of forcing the issue, they've looked at it and said, wow, you know, I mean, you could hear it in the voices of those, of those health insurance executives of the opportunities that they just weren't seeing previously. So um, no, they, they weren't on board at first, but um, we are seeing the culture change. And I think that you're going to see health plans become more proactive in this space and actually more supportive uh, than just reactionary. Yeah, we have a couple more questions here in the chat, but I do just want to say if anyone has a meeting or a class at one, feel free to duck out, but I think we'll keep going if you have time for a couple more questions. Um, Norm Carroll asks, to what degree do PBMs pass rebates back to plan sponsors? That's a trick question, Norman. Uh, the So PBMs define what a rebate is, okay? You and I might say that a rebate is every dime that a drug maker kicks back to a PBM, that's a rebate. That's not how PBMs define it in their contracts. Okay, so PBMs will tell you that they pass 90, 95, 99, 100% of their rebates uh, back to plan sponsors, okay? But that's rebate in terms of what they define it. I have talked with, with benefits consultants who have found PBMs labeling rebates in anywhere from 10 to 40 different types of definitions. So there's rebates and then there's formulary fees, there's transaction fees, there's, and then PBMs have their own rebate aggregators who get the rebate before the PBM technically gets the rebate, but they own the rebate aggregator. So there's a lot of shell game that goes on with rebates. Um, it, it's, uh, it would be like if I said, I'll, I'll, I'll try a, a, a um, metaphor on the fly. If I said that I passed all of my macaroni to my son, you know, I'd say, yeah, I, I passed all the macaroni. Well, macaroni is actually technically a term of art and I've got all this fusilli and tortellini and gnocchi over here. I'm not passing any of that through, but the macaroni, that's all his. That's how they were doing the rebate game now. <laughs> Thank you for that, that metaphor. 
Um, we have one more in the chat from Tyler Wagner from an PHA perspective. Is it more likely that states will have to pass legislation similar to Ohio to achieve some level of provider status before something will get passed on a federal level? So APHA is, it should come as no secret, American Pharmacists Association is all in on provider status and they have been for, for quite some time. Uh, the problem is, is that the feds are the feds uh, and you know pharmacists are, are definitely not the shiniest object for them to focus on. Um, our internal discussions at APHA have been really centered on, let's not put all our eggs in the basket in the federal, in the federal program let's surround them. You know, we have low hanging fruit in a lot of states. It's, um, you know, it, I think five years from now, we're gonna look at states that don't have provider status and say, what is, what, what's their problem? I mean, it, it is going to be the norm in Medicaid programs in the commercial sector. And then at that point, then it begs the question, well, why wouldn't we offer these same awesome services to seniors who arguably need the most amount of care closer to home? So I think that um, we're gonna see more and more state dominoes fall, um, more and more state associations. We've had great conversations with the National Alliance of State Pharmacy Associations. More states are gonna start prioritizing this because we're not gonna solve this PBM problem easily. And so until it gets fixed, um, until, until all these payment issues get fixed, um, you know, we're going to need to start diversifying the pharmacy revenue stream. That's where, that's where provider status comes in. So I think, um, I think, yes, more and more states are probably going to hit before we see something pass at the federal level, but I would not be pessimistic about the federal's push. Um, 2021 is very different than 2017 in the previous decades. Ph people are looking at pharmacy way different uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, and they were already starting to look at them differently because of the evolving scope of practice. So um, I'm bullish on provider status, absolutely. Sure, great. Thank you for those answers. Um, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to unmute and ask or drop them in the chat. I'll give you a few, few seconds here, but otherwise um, I think that's all from us. Well, look, I appreciate it very much. Uh, if anybody ever has any questions, happy to answer. Um, I appreciate all your participation and uh, thanks for having me, VCU. Raphael, Raphael signs your 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 proud alumnus. He he uh, he he said you were all great people, so I'm I'm happy to be on. <laughs>